So now the main story here is that anytime you have a distributed data uh, that you need for machine learning, let's say, then the data is unavailable because of privacy or trade secrets or regulation. Uh, and so what we can do is we can use privacy preserving algorithms to support machine learning algorithms that have been decentralized. So this is the challenge we have, right? On one hand, uh, we have on this privacy utility access uh, for Google Maps, we willingly give away our location uh, to Google so that Google can do calculations of traffic and show us in real time, you know, the re red spots and the green spots, right? Great utility, no privacy. Uh, for health data, uh, we don't give away our health data, so it stays in silos, and so we get very little utility. And so the goal for privacy preserving machine learning is to have privacy and utility at the same time. But to do full-fledged machine learning, either you anonymize, but then if you use an overlapping data set, it can be deciphered, or you use something called smashing. Uh, and two techniques have emerged in the last few years. One is called federated learning uh, from Google, and the second is called split learning, which is from our group at MIT. And the basic idea behind both these techniques is to share wisdom, but not raw data. So if you think about the smartphones, I would just want the wisdom from the smartphones. I don't need to ask raw data, especially personally identifiable data. The challenge is how do you do this in a privacy preserving way, right? Which means that no phone number, no, uh, no name or email address or student ID number or, or things like that should be asked for. Uh, and what we need to do is get to this model where you know, um, the data doesn't even get sent to a server in its raw form. And if you achieve that, then we have a win-win. So let's, uh, let's do an experiment. I want you to open your phone, uh, open the um, iMessage or whatever you use, you know, text messenger, SMS, SMS, SMS messenger, type love, L-O-V-E, and then space. And as you know, in the bottom, it'll give you three choices for next word. It should either reveal the person you write to quite a bit, either their first name or whatever you call them or, or things like that. Now, here's the question. Apple and Google are not looking at your text messages. They're end-to-end -end encrypted. So how are they able to predict what's going on? Because it's a next word prediction scheme, right? There's a machine learning model that's being trained from billions of phones, literally, and they're able to predict the next word. And so, so what's happening is, uh, the machine learning model for next one prediction is being trained partially on billions of phones and those models are being combined. And there's some additional um, uh, stuff that happens. So for example, if you're writing your credit card number, then it doesn't want to remember that. So it adds differential privacy, it adds some blur to it and so on. So it won't, it won't overfit basically. And then when the model comes down to your phone, uh, it has to do some kind of a transfer learning. So it, it trains one more time so that when I, when I type love, the next word is my wife's name, and for you it's something else, right? So it also trains those models so they don't get confused, right? It doesn't start writing somebody else's name <laughs> when I say love. <laughs> so it's kind of an interesting world we live in where we are able to provide all the services in a completely privacy-preserving way. Why can't they do this for you know, predicting if somebody's gonna get a heart attack? All those models are already there. There's enough data on people's phones to solve some of the most important societal problems.